like him. He worked uh, as a professor still in Calgary, where he started the therapy program. I think he's retired from that, leaving that now. And he's been known in family practice for ages. And in fact, in 2006, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award for that. And given that the ideas are in a different epistemology than a lot of people work in, in, in ontology, he has, of course, been able to contribute a lot of thoughtful things. And I should also recommend his book. I started reading it by because I get PDFs that I can read on my screen. And uh, it is a should have been written for the lay person because it is so useful and appropriate for a lot of uh, the thoughts we may have about the patterns of interpersonal relationship. So with that as a beginning, I hope I haven't put you in the spot in any way, Carl. Mm. Feel free to lead at this. But I'm going to say one thing. When we come to questions, would you please put up your hand using the, uh, what what's the name of that button? The actions button. And please keep your part of talking when we get to there later, relatively short, so everybody has a chance and we don't get any lectures from the participants. Thank you. Well, thank you for those kind words, Pili. I really appreciate that. It's been great to connect with you finally. I also heard about you from Umberto over the years. So I'm essentially a therapist. Um, but I'm uh, a kind of therapist that's quite interested in theory and, and ideas and explanations and so forth. And so I, I managed to land a, an academic job, which has allowed that to unfold over the years. And I've been very privileged, actually, to meet people over my career, like Gregory Bateson and hang out with Umberto Maturana and Heinz von Forrester and, and many other colleagues over the years. Um, and one of the things that I've been striving towards is incorporating some of the ideas from both uh, first order and second order cybernetics in my uh, clinical work. And so what I've uh, done today is to uh, pull together some of my, my work, and I'm going to be using PowerPoint slides to share some of that with you today, and, and hopefully we'll have a bit of discussion uh, towards the end. So I'll share my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay. It's working. All right. So at the beginning of my, or the introduction for the, in the book, I mentioned this um, experience that I had when I was a sky resident. It was sort of like an inadvertent natural experiment. Uh, it's something that you couldn't do because of the ethics involved, but the major, a major support was temporarily withdrawn from a, uh, a patient uh, in their, their, in their primary relationship. So this happened when I was a psychiatry resident at the Hamilton Psychiatric Hospital in 1970, where a 36-year-old woman was admitted with severe depression and high suicide risk. And uh, she had a full gamut of uh, psychiatric uh, therapies. Uh, she uh, had uh, antidepressant medication. She was seen in individual psychotherapy. She was attending group psychotherapy. She was involved in media therapy. But despite all these therapies, she remained chronically depressed and con was considered a high suicide risk. And her husband uh, was seen as a very important resource. He would come to visit her regularly. He worked full time. He took care of the kids and maintained the household. So he was a very active and energetic uh, person. It was major support for her. Then something happened outside of her direct um, care that influenced her condition significantly. Her husband happened to be involved in a major car accident in which two people in the other vehicle were killed. And fortunately, he wasn't seriously injured himself, but the experience of that accident uh, was very traumatic for him. And what made things even worse for him was that the um, police charged him with reckless driving and manslaughter which threw him for a real loop. And so he wasn't able to maintain his high level of activity that he had before, and he began to flounder, uh, and he wasn't able to cope very well. And so his wife uh, asked the staff at the hospital if they would give her a pass to go home to help out. Um, and at first they were hesitant to do so because they were afraid that if she went home, she might take suicidal action, but they only gave her a two hour pass to start with, 
Um, and she went home, did some work and came back to the hospital and handled it responsibly so that the staff felt comfortable in giving her longer and longer passes. And she began to feel better and better about herself as she was uh, making a contribution. And her depression over the next few weeks improved to the point that she felt that she had made a full recovery. Uh, and in follow-up, after discharge, she reported that she felt completely well and hadn't felt better for years. And this then continued on for several months uh, while her husband was continuing to flounder and he was struggling and he felt bad because he wasn't able to do what he used to be able to do uh, before. However, after about 18 months or so, when the court proceedings finally came to conclusion uh, and the judge determined that the husband wasn't guilty of of reckless driving or manslaughter, it was in fact a genuine accident and so forth, then of course he was relieved um, and he then was felt energized and started to you know, resume his previous high level of activity. Um, and um, unwittingly, uh, this his activity then displaced her contributions and she began slipping back into depression. And before she could be re-hospitalized, she killed herself. Uh, so my colleagues and I, when we heard about her death, were shocked. Like, what happened? What's going on here? Um, and so uh, we called a uh, conference, uh, had a psychological post-mortem meeting to try to understand what was going on in this situation. And we came up with this systemic explanation that perhaps she was caught in this pervasive interaction pattern of over-adequate, inadequate reciprocity. Uh, where one person's overadded functioning would invite the other to function less adequately, and their underfunctioning then would feed the process of overfunctioning. And if we look at it, say, in terms of before the accident, where she was presented as underfunctioning, being depressed and struggling and so forth, and the husband took, took up all the slack, and he was functioning well by working full time, taking care of the kids in the household and everything and so forth. But after the accident, then the wife then moved to the position of being the overadequate member of that dynamic, uh, and he was underfunctioning. Um, and then after the court uh, proceedings came to conclusion, he resumed his overadequate functioning and so forth. Now, presumably, as she was slipping down into that position of being the underadequate functioning member of that dyad, uh, she couldn't see a way out except um, through death, and hence she took suicidal action. And I'm not blaming the husband here. I'm just, I think both members of this couple were suffering, but they're caught in this relational dynamic that was problematic. So while the participants in the interaction uh, changed their positions, the problematic pattern remained the same uh, as it was a continuing process. Now, in my experience, clients almost always present with individual problems, even when they come for family therapy. Uh, they identify one family member as being problematic in their behavior or their attitude or their feelings and the mood or whatever. Um, and so it's very difficult, I think, for family members or even clinicians sometimes to see the way in which these problems are embedded in relational dynamics. In the case that I described now, everyone, including the woman herself, assumed that she had a serious individual problem of depression. Uh, yet when she was treated individually with a full range of psychiatric therapies, she didn't uh, improve significantly. However, when the primary relationship she was embedded in suddenly had changed, her condition improved dramatically. And in retrospect, the change in the couple relationship appeared to be more powerful in enabling individual therapeutic change than all the traditional psychiatric therapies combined. Now, when I came to see it this way, I resolved in myself to not become the kind of psychiatrist who would miss these kinds of relational dynamics and influences on an individual's well-being. I wanted to understand if there were these kinds of relational pressures contributed to an individual phenomenology. I wanted to, to uh, recognize them so I could perhaps uh, try to work with them and, and deal with them, which led me then to try to understand families and systems and uh, eventually get into family therapy. So I began using George Engel's biopsychosocial framework to guide my assessment and treatment of clinical situations where I differentiated, say, dynamics of dysfunction, say, at the biological level, which would connect to the psychological level and the social level. And I was then focusing mainly on the right-hand side of this figure where I was looking at the interpersonal and social dysfunction 
as contributing to individual psychological or biological dysfunction. And I assume that there are multiple pathways of ongoing influences between the three levels, uh, the psychosomatic path, the, psych the somatopsychic path, and so forth. And uh, I was interested in all these, these connections, but still I was trying to elucidate the relational problems at the social level as much as I could. So I made an attempt to integrate multiple theories about therapy, and I used the cybernetic metaphor of circular feedback to connect ideas from cognitive theory, psychodynamics, and behaviorism to explain patterns of problematic social interaction. So I was using this, this idea of, of a circular process of feedback loops, um, and so I would place these enclosures representing two persons uh, having feelings and perceptions and thoughts and so forth, and then I placed behaviors on the, the arrows linking the, the two persons. And I called this a circular pattern diagramming, which I found useful in terms of helping me to understand the relational process. And this model uh, served me well for about 10 years or so, uh, because it gave me multiple opportunities for intervention. Uh, if I was, say, focused on psychodynamics, I might, you know, primary focus on, say, frustration and anger in one person. Or if I was more cognitive, I might look at their way of giving understanding, giving meaning, or seeing the unfairness in the situation. Um, or if I was more behavioral, I would try perhaps to modify the kinds of patterns of behavior that were contributing to this pattern. Or I could try to disrupt the circularity itself. So I had these multiple points of entry. However, I eventually abandoned this model this framework, and it's so so helpful at the time, but eventually I, I abandoned it. Why was it abandoned? Well, what happened was that it biased me to privilege objective assumptions about what's really happening, because uh, I sort of assumed that this was really going on out there, um, and it then it also allowed me to drift back to individualistic thinking as I sort of tended to look at those enclosures and look for the emotions or the perceptions within persons that were feeding this problematic pattern. And the effect in my clinical work as a therapist was that I found myself implicitly blaming the persons in the pattern for blaming each other. So I would be blaming the person who is angry for you know, blaming and attacking the other or the person who is a fearful and because they feel threatened and avoiding and distancing, I'd be blaming them for the, those contributions to the the uh, circular process. So I found I've, this was a problem for me because I didn't want to you know, privilege objective assumptions or go back to individualistic thinking. So I tried to find a way out of this. And eventually I found that if I tried to privilege this figure ground gestalt uh, and make a shift from looking at seeing the two faces to see the, the vase in between those two faces. So I wanted to understand like what is the behavioral shape or the emotional tone of the interpersonal space in this particular relationship. Um, and I found that the stronger that I focus on the relationship, the more the individual faces drift into the background. And you can see that yourself as you look at the faces, you don't see the shape of the vase. But if you look at the vase, you don't see this, the faces. And this for me was very helpful in terms of helping me to think of what can I do to get a stronger grip on what's going on in that interpersonal relational space. So I drew from a few basic concepts from systems theory, which all of you are probably familiar with. Systems are composites. They're always made up of component parts. So a family as a system is made up of often, you know, usually a mother, father, and children, and so forth. Um, and of course, the aphorism of change in any one part results in change in every other part. So if, say, the father falls ill or has a traumatic experience, and of course, everybody changes as a result of, of the change in his behavior and so forth. But when I came across this aphorism, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, it intuitively made sense to me, but I didn't grasp what it really meant until a few years later when I realized that the way in which a whole system is the sum more than the sum of the, its parts is that it includes all the parts plus the unique relations between those parts. So if you take a man and a woman and a child who are not related together, they don't constitute a family system because the family system has a history of relationships which constitute it as a family of a particular kind, uh, which was a helpful insight for me. 
Now, systems, as you know, can be analyzed at different levels and in different domains where different phenomena arise. For instance, biological systems, uh, you know, or organism systems are characterized by homeostasis and autonomy. But human relationship systems are characterized by recurrent reciprocal and or circular interaction patterns. And I found this a very useful concept to help me focus then on that, what's going on in that relational space. So if we take this as a, say, a, a three-person family system, and we're trying to adopt a systemic uh, perspective, we're interested then, of course, in the interaction between, say, the mother and father, and the mother and daughter, and the father and daughter, and so forth. And of course, things are more complicated than that, because the daughter influences the relationship between the parents, and the mother influences the relationship between the father and and daughter, and that relationship influences the mother, and so forth. And of course, every family member is interacting with people outside the, you know, immediate family, and and so forth. And then, in addition to all that complexity, by virtue of the phenomenon of memory, um, that each family member can, over time, internalize within themselves the family constellation in which they live which opens space for a process which I refer to as internalized other interviewing, which I don't have time to go into today. But it does make it possible to smuggle systemic ways of thinking and practicing past the skin-bounded separateness of individuals to deconstruct individuals into systems and work them in that way. Now, let me go back to the three-person figure again. And as I mentioned earlier, for systemic and orientation, we all want to understand their interactions. But what I wanted to to develop is a way of sitting down with a family. And instead of seeing this, which we're biased to see by virtue of our sensory apparatus of you know, vision and, and um, hearing and so forth, but to sit down with a family and to see this. Now that's not easy to sit down with, you know, a, a number of people and see their relationship patterns is not an easy thing to do. So I tried to, with my colleagues, create a way of, of thinking that would help me to see those relational dynamics. And I found that some of the ideas from uh, Umberto Maturana's cultural biology were helpful in this regard. Now, as you probably all know, that his specific theory of knowledge provides an explanation for how we as human beings come to know what we know. And he defines language then as arising through the consensual coordination of the consensual coordination of conduct in the social domain. And in our living, we interact within our niche and use language, you know, from our culture to bring forth entities by drawing distinctions in our cognition. And once distinguished, an entity is, can be seen as interacting with other en entities, including other persons or oneself. And part of Maturana's theory is that instructive interaction is impossible by virtue of his assumption of structured determinism, that the results of an interaction are always determined by the structure of the entities that are interacting and structural coupling occurs when ongoing interactions between two or more entities become stabilized through mutual invitations that have become habitual. Now, the word invitations here is extremely important because it does respect the autonomy of the other to respond in the way in which they're liable to do so. Uh, and the other thing about invitational interactions is that implicitly an invitation can be declined. It can be taken up, and often it is taken up, certainly when patterns become habitual. But nonetheless, that description is, I think, is very, very useful for me as a clinician. And the coupling then between uh, two living systems presents then as a pattern within the relationship. So the circular pattern diagramming model then was reconceived as multiple couplings in the interpersonal space. So I would, I would then couple the behaviors in this kind of pattern or the, uh, the perceptions or distinctions, perceiving unfairness invites perceiving threats and so forth. And then coupling the emotional dynamics where anger invites fear and fear invites more anger in the other party. And this was helpful for me because that, that's, that enclosure of the person that I was of, often seduced into again disappeared and it would help me to maintain my focus then on that relational space. So to strengthen our ability then to distinguish these patterns in the interpersonal space, my colleagues and I invented what we called, came to call the IPSCOPE. So what exactly is the IPSCOPE? The IPSCOPE is a cognitive instrument for distinguishing and describing specific interpersonal patterns of interaction for systemic assessment. It draws upon 
both perceptual and conceptual skills in the observer. And by definition, interpersonal patterns are repetitive or recurrent interactions between two or more persons that constitute a transient but important component of the overall relationship between those persons. And IPS may be distinguished by a systemic observer or systemic therapist by highlighting the coupling between two classes of behaviors, cognitions, or emotions that tend to be mutually enabling and are mutually reinforcing. And the suffix scope in the IPS scope is intended to draw an analogy with other human-made instruments which help observers see that which is ordinarily hard for the naked eye to see by comparison to the microscope or telescope. So these systemic patterns and are parts of the vase between the persons who are interacting. Uh, and this is where I wanted to focus on in terms of my capacity to draw distinctions that were relevant for the well-being of the participants in those patterns. Now the IPSCOPE employs simple simple di uh, graphic diagrams to clarify the coupling of behaviors distinguished in the patterns. So right now we're in a pattern of me doing a lot of talking, inviting you to listen, and your listening of course invites me to continue talking. And so this is a, a very common pattern that we as human beings enter into repeatedly again and again. Now the circularity of the graphic implies the pattern of interaction that repeats itself again and again, and which reflects an ongoing or important aspect of an ongoing relationship. The text describes observable, observable behaviors distinguished in the pattern, and we often use the gerund form of the ing, of listening or talking and so forth. Um, and the arched arrows imply invitations that are mutual and that recur, and the arrows should not be regarded as lineal, deterministic, or causal connections. And then the slash in the center implies the reciprocity of the structural coupling of the behaviors that occur in the interpersonal space. So the diagram then reflects a distillate of, as it were, a history of recurrent interactions which foreground the coupling of the behaviors that are distinguished in the pattern. So for instance, a very common wellness pattern is for one person to suggest something to a second person and the second person responds to the first person. And then of course that affirms the first person for making the suggestion to start with. However, if the second person is not that responsive, the first person might amp amplify their uh, suggestion and move towards pressuring the other to submit, whereas the other might then resist that, uh, and the pattern can change from a very positive and healthy pattern to a problematic or pathologizing pattern. So the patterns, when they're drawn vertically in our work, we 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 this is helpful in terms of. Uh, disclosing a power differential between the relevant behaviors. In other words, the pressuring is more powerful in maintaining this dynamic than the resisting. Uh, and this, of course, leads to some um, relevance in terms of therapy, in terms of we try to deconstruct the, the uh, more dominant component of the behavior first because it makes the change process smoother. So there are multiple components of the IPSCOPE, and it uh, entails a typology of at least seven, seven different kinds of interpersonal patterns which can be grouped into three clusters of core patterns, transition patterns, or external patterns. Among the core patterns are wellness interpersonal patterns, or WIPs, um, PIPs, or pathologizing interpersonal patterns, and HIPs, which are healing interpersonal patterns. And included in the transition patterns are transforming interpersonal patterns and deteriorating interpersonal patterns. And then the external patterns include social cultural influencing patterns and the social network interaction patterns. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll go through the first four because uh, I don't have time to cover it all. But I'll give you some examples of the first four kinds of patterns. Um, so important features of the IPSCOPE, these describe tr relational stabilities, but they're transient. And they're constituted by joint actions where patterns are created mutually. These patterns are always changing and are never permanent. However, when they are active, they profoundly influence the participants' moment-to-moment -moment experience. IPS do not have a physical existence. They exist in the imagination of systemic observers. They are cognitive constructions that may be regarded as serviceable fictions in that they serve to guide the initiatives of systemic therapists that are not necessarily objective or real. Their existence depends on the distinctions drawn by a systemic observer. To limit the possibility of excessive exuberance in an observer's imagination, for instance, to construct just anything, 
Ips are usually described in behavioral terms using gerunds, that is action words ending in ing, such as criticizing or withdrawing, which then help ground the patterns in observable transactions. So let's start to define, say, some of the, these patterns. Pips or pathologizing interpersonal pattern is defined as a recurrent interpersonal interaction which activates or increases negativity, pain, and or suffering in one or both persons that are interacting or which results in deterioration of the relationship. So here's a very common garden variety pathologizing pattern that all of you I'm sure are familiar with and have been in from time to time. Where criticizing invites defending and defending invites further criticizing. Now what's interesting in the, about this pattern is that once this pattern gets started in a family system, it tends to recruit second, or sorry, sorry third and fourth uh, uh, parties. So say if a father begins by criticizing a son for some behavior and the son you know, responds by defending against the father's criticism, the mother could join in to also join the father to criticize the son, or the mother could join to defend the son against the father's criticism. It doesn't matter which side the mother goes on, the pattern just is amplified and gets worse. In addition, because people are so familiar with this pattern, the participants in the pattern can easily switch places very, very quickly, uh, but the pattern remains the same. So for a while, the, the son safer could keep defending himself against the father's criticism, but then he might sort of suddenly shift and start criticizing the father for being so critical at which point the father then becomes defensive. So the father and son can switch places, but the pattern remains the same. Now, because we as therapists are also familiar with this pattern, we can e easily join the pattern as well. And so I, as a therapist, could join by criticizing the father for being critical, or I could sort of defend the son against the father's criticism, or, or I could you know, join the father to criticize the son for being disrespectful. It doesn't matter again where I, I join, I, I can actually add more fuel to the fire, so to speak, uh, and make things worse. So as a systemic therapist, I need to be mindful of that danger and risk uh, when I'm working with this kind of problem. Another very common pathologizing pattern is a pattern of one person imposing uh, their ideas or beliefs or practices on someone else who then struggles against them and resists, uh, which activates some further impositional practices. Now, let me introduce you then to WIPs and wellness interpersonal patterns are defined as recurrent interpersonal interactions that enable generativity, competence, and or effectiveness in one or both participants and or that sustains or enhances health in the relationship. So this is a very common pattern where one person acknowledges another, the other person appreciates that acknowledgement and the first person then feels uh, affirmed by their behavior and so forth. And pa patterns of acknowledgement are, are very common and, and arise spontaneously between human beings automatically. And, and I would submit that patterns of acknowledgement is a, the phenomenon that, that raises, creates respect between human beings. Uh, and there's many ways of acknowledging each other and so forth. Now, I want to also introduce you to another wellness pattern, which describes probably the most efficacious way of learning in a relationship. So if one party offers a second some constructive feedback and the second person then learns from their mistakes, the first person feels good about their contribution and that stabilizes the pattern and so forth. And this is very useful in terms of coaching relationships and so forth. However, the danger with this particular wellness pattern is that what is intended as constructive feedback could be heard by the second person as criticism. If it's taken as criticism, then that person is more likely to respond you know, with defensiveness rather than learning from mistakes. And if they become defensive, then the first person becomes critical of them in taking their constructive feedback in the wrong way, and they slip from this wellness pattern into the pathologizing pattern that I described earlier of criticism coupled with uh, defensiveness. So it's, it's useful to recognize the, the, the slippery nature of some of these wellness patterns. And because of that, it, my colleagues and I felt it was useful to distinguish a subcategory of wellness patterns, which we refer to as healing interpersonal patterns. It's a subcategory of wellness pattern that constitutes a specific antidote to a particular pathologizing pattern by bringing forth positive behaviors and or experiences in one or both of the interactants that specifically preclude or contradict some component of the pathologizing pattern. So an example here 
is to selectively notice the competence of the other, which invites the other to enact more competence. So if we go back to the pathologizing pattern of criticizing coupled with defending, if instead of criticizing or offering, say, constructive feedback, we privilege this uh, behavior of selectively noticing the competence of the other, that precludes criticism. Like it's not possible to criticize a person at the same time as you notice their competence. When I mean, you could still interpret that as being sarcastic, I suppose, but it's less likely uh, to slip into that pathologizing dynamic. And hence to privilege this particular initiative of selective noticing and competence as a way to move out of the pathologizing pattern towards more of a healing pattern. Um, and another very common and powerful healing dynamic is this relational dynamic of apologizing coupled with forgiving. And there's many, of course, strategies to bring this forth in uh, troubled relationships. Now, I want to finally draw your attention to this fourth pattern, um, the transforming interpersonal pattern, because it's the kind of pattern that we as therapists want to be in in our relationships with our clients or families that we're working with. It's also a subcategory of a wellness pattern, but it's a specific kind of wellness pattern that enables movement away from a pathologizing pattern towards a healing or a wellness pattern. So a clarifying, basic clarifying conversation itself could be characterized as a tip where one person, a therapist in this case, is asking about the concerns of another. This invites the client or patient to disclose their concerns, which then makes it possible for us to ask more specific and relevant questions about their concerns. And this kind of clarifying conversation sometimes in itself enables a movement from the pathology into more healing or wellness. Now, a more proactive movement, though, in the transforming interpersonal pattern could be a co-constructive pattern where the therapist asks reflexive questions to open space for new possibilities. And that invites then the client to distinguish those new possibilities and to consider new initiatives, which of course invites the therapist to go further with respect to uh, other questions that might be helpful to even open more space for the other to move in those preferred directions. Now, what are reflexive questions? Well, that's another issue then to maybe focus on. So my colleagues and I have developed a process of interventive interviewing um, as a means to enable therapeutic skills in fostering movement from problematic patterns of pathologizing interpersonal patterns towards preferred patterns of interaction, namely the healing patterns and the wellness patterns. So what exactly is interventive interviewing? It's an inclusive orientation to interviewing in which everything that an interviewer says and does and does not say and does not do is regarded as an intervention, which could be helpful, unhelpful, or perhaps even harmful. Now, you might easily join me to accept that everything that we say or do could be helpful or not helpful. It may not be as obvious to you how what we don't say and what we don't do could be helpful or unhelpful or problematic. So let me give an example. So say if I'm working with a couple, and in the course of the interview, the wife says, and yesterday he slapped me, and I don't say anything or do anything about that, then that is liable to be noticed by both the husband and wife. And the wife might think, I'm not sure that I can trust this therapist. He doesn't understand and appreciate the, the situation that I'm in here. And the husband might think to himself, well, I guess this therapist thinks that's normal couple behavior and that's you know something that's okay. Now, both of those ways of giving meaning to the, the absence of a response is counter-therapeutic, of course. And so it's quite a complex orientation to adopt this, this perspective of interventive interviewing. Um, and it's something that I came to after many years of working with, with clients. At first, I used to believe that it was when I decided to intervene that it was an intervention. But I came to realize that a lot of things are going on, that it, interventive processes are going on all the time. Now, interventive interviewing then encourages greater participatory responsibility for what unfolds in the interview process by assuming that it's impossible to interact with others and not intervene in some way on the autonomous functioning of those other persons. Um, and adopting an orientation of interventive interviewing shifts the focus from whether a specific intervention should be used or not to pay more attention to the ongoing effects of interventions that are always taking place in the continuous interaction between an interviewer and the interviewees. So I did some research um, to develop a classification of different kinds of and groups of questions that have different effects in this interviewing 
uh, interventive interviewing process. And my purpose here was to enhance my awareness of different kinds of questions and their possible, probable, improbable, or impossible effects on the interaction. And I want to increase my possible choices and skills in therapeutic interviewing. And so the means that I used for this research was to re review my own videotaped clinical interviews. And the reason why this was important is because it helped me to sort of look behind what was happening on the surface to the background intentions in formulating and asking a particular kind of question. So I identified you know, interaction sequences and clarified them in discussion with students and colleagues and sometimes even clients. Um, and over time, I gradually identified two useful dimensions. Uh, one was the intentionality of the interviewer in asking any specific question. And secondly, the background assumptions about the nature of the interaction process in which the question is embedded. And I use those, those dimensions then to uh, classify different kinds of questions. So let me introduce you to them. So a continuum of an inter interviewer's intentionality when asking any question can vary from an orienting intent where my reason to ask the question is to orient myself to the client situation and their experience, as opposed to the other extreme on the right-hand side, the influencing intent. Um, now, obviously, when I ask a question to influence, I listen to the answer, I get oriented anyway. Um, and of course, when I'm orienting, trying to orient myself, the, the questions that I ask to orient myself can still influence a client. Um, so it's, it's a both-and perspective that I'm trying to privilege here. So for instance, if I ask a question like, do you talk to anyone when you have suicidal thoughts? Um, I could, or, or I could ask, who could you talk to when you have suicidal thoughts? So the second question here on the right-hand side, I'm trying to invite the client to consider talking more to other people about their inner struggles and so forth, uh, which is a, potentially a more therapeutic initiative to take. Uh, and then if so, so I'm orienting myself, I could ask like, are things getting better, better or worse? Like it's, that my intent is to change my understanding of their situation. I could ask instead like, you know, what have you noticed that is a little bit better? Uh, and adopting more of a solution oriented uh, perspective. So this helped me then to clarify you know, which kinds of questions are more likely to be useful. Uh, if I'm able to, I would like to always be asking questions at the influencing end of this continuum, because if I listen to the answer, I get oriented anyway. Uh, and so to me, it's, it's much uh, a richer uh, place to, to be grounded. Then the other dimension that was useful, to, I took from Gregory Bateson's work in terms of the lineal assumptions with a directional process as opposed to circular assumptions with an invitational process. And, and Bateson points out, of course, how circular dynamics are so, so significant in mental processes. Um, and here, um, again, you know, I could ask the question, say, how long has Johnny been a problem? Or I could ask, how long have you been having problems with Johnny? So if I ask the second question, I implicate the person I'm speaking with is in a relationship with Johnny and the problems are part of, potentially part of that relational dynamic. Uh, another question here is, you know, what are you worried about that might happen in terms of the direction, in terms of outcomes, or I could ask, you know, who is most worried about what might happen? Uh, which again, is more likely to bring a relational perspective into the uh, therapeutic conversation. So this helped me then to develop this framework of these two axes and four quadrants uh, to distinguish uh, lineal questions that were based on lineal assumptions and uh, grounded in orienting intent, as opposed to circular questions, which are grounded in circular assumptions and an orienting intent uh, to, to get myself oriented to the circularity of their situation. Um, and that comes from Mara Saldini Palazzoli's work. Um, and strategic questions, uh, which are lineal, um, and they're but they're intended to influence where you want them to go. Whereas reflexive questions are questions that and are are based on more circular assumptions, but influence the, the intended is to influence. And this comes from um, Vern Cronin and Barnett Pierce's work. So some examples here. Then, if I ask questions like, you know, what did he steal, or what, why did he steal the cookies but not the money, I would locate those as lineal questions. Uh, on the other hand, I could ask, like, who's most concerned about the stealing? You know, when he took the cookies, what did she do? 
Uh, so I, I'm more interested in the context and the relational dynamics. I want to understand those for myself. Uh, with strategic questions, I could ask, well, why don't you hide the cookies or lock them up so you can't steal them? So I'm influencing, but I'm, I'm kind of pushing them in terms of an idea that I think would be good for them. Uh, on the other hand, I could ask more reflexive questions, like a possibility, like if she acknowledged him waiting for his turn to get cookies, what might he do in terms of uh, the unfolding of behavior patterns and so forth? So this, this, this helped me in terms of differentiating different kinds of questions that had different effects. Um, and in re reflection, I found that there are two theoretical paradigms were inherent in this model. That first of all, at the top of the diagram was grounded in more tra traditional objectivist or empirical paradigm, whereas the bottom, yeah, this and we supported the lineal questions and strategic questions, whereas the bottom of the diagram was more grounded in systemic or social constructionist paradigm, understanding of the circular questions and reflexive questions, which led me then to develop a rich repertoire of circular and reflexive questions in my clinical work, which I found very, very helpful. And so I, I tried to move as much as possible to work at the bottom of this, this framework. So circular questions then can be used to deconstruct individual problems into interpersonal patterns to enhance a client's systemic understanding. So say if a child is acting out or misbehaving and I see the parents is criticizing and or punishing the child and I can see there's a pattern here going on, this pathologizing pattern. So as a therapist then, I can ask questions to clarify those patterns by asking the parents questions. Like when he acts out and creates a big mess, what do you do? Or to ask like when you try to discipline him in that way, what does he typically do? So I'm trying to bring forth and clarify understanding of the parents in terms of how they are implicated in the process of interaction that supports and enables as it were the child's acting out and misbehaving. Then reflexive questions can be asked then to co-construct a wellness in the personal pattern on the client's systemic understanding. Where say if I hypothesize, like if the parents could be more empathic about the child's frustration, this could invite the child to maybe disclose their inner confusion and turmoil, which would enhance their empathy. And so as a therapist, I could ask reflexive questions to open space for better possibilities. Like what do you imagine might be going on for him when he begins behaving in that way? I suppose he could express his inner experiences. What might he actually say? Um, and so I found that learning to formulate and ask reflexive questions or circular questions helped me as a therapist uh, to enable my clinical work um, in terms of opening space for clients to move towards healing and wellness. So I'll stop there and um, be open to respond to questions and comments. Thank you, Carl. Um, may I start with a question of my own <laughs> to open the question session? I, I find it easy if I'm looking at my grandchildren and asking a therapeutic kind of question, how, how did go, did it work better this way now that you tried it at school? Uh, but if I do the same to my husband, it doesn't come across as a therapist and doesn't <laughs> feel like I'm part of the, part of the, fa the couple then. How do you properly ask that kind of a question to somebody you're in relationship with. Well, that's a very, very good point. Um, in one's personal relationships, one can be therapeutic, but um, you can't be a therapist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because because that implies a power differential and, yes, exactly. and, that, and that places the relationship in, in a different uh, frame. Uh, yeah, so uh, I suppose it would be possible to invite an open conversation about the issue, you know, with your husband. <laughs> you if, know, if so like, an issue, but I'm just I've yeah, seen the pattern. Yeah, to but maybe share some of your own discomfort or whatever it is first, yeah. right? And invite him to help you rather than you help him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Then, then he might be more likely to join in, in a in a constructive way. And then way. it's an invitation rather than the power. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. So uh, having asked my burning question, I'd like to open the floor. Fred has a question. 
Yeah, uh, Carl, thanks so much for such a uh, comprehensive summary of about 45 or 50 years of wonderful work. And it's so good to see you again. Likewise. Um, my, my question, well, my question is about questions and really uh, maybe it's an invitation for you to say a little bit more about interventive interviewing, but knowing how others have used your work. Uh, and that has to do with your own noticing when in asking an, a circular question, occasions where you might notice that someone is noticing what they haven't noticed before uh, as invited by the questions that you might be asking. So it's kind of bringing you into the circular questioning process itself, but the importance of allowing people to notice what they're not noticing through your, you know, your very relational approach to recognizing the significance of questions we ask. Absolutely. And, and of course, the solution-focused therapists have highlighted the importance of being selective in asking questions to invite the other to recognize possibilities that are solution-oriented, right? I mean, yeah. an extreme statement of a solution-oriented therapist is to say that problems are irrelevant. Um, I don't go that far because I do see connections between problems and solutions. Um, but nonetheless, they do ask questions to privilege you know, people recognizing the constructive possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, so my, since I, I'm sure other people have questions, but Carl, my question was also an invitation to you to reconnect uh, and to follow up on our conversations from many years ago. So yeah, it's so nice to so see it's you. It's a relational again. aspect to it too, yeah. Yes, it's so nice to see you again after so many years, yeah. People are being quiet today. We were at the beginning. <laughs> you are again. Please do feel free to. Oh, David Tate has a question. Um, it's it's kind of a almost a double question, but it, it's I, I'm tantalized in, into expanding what I was hearing you presenting, and that you have this um, nice formal pattern structure with a a number of patterns that you're looking at for interpersonal relationships. And then you are talking about ways that one can move one pattern configuration into some other pattern configuration. And so there, there's a patterning going on there. So I'm, I'm looking for an expansion of what I will call the pattern language that, that looks at the different ways and the shifts and, and the kinds of automaticities that you might get. So if you have um, incorrectly interpreted uh, constructive criticism and it becomes, it flips into this other pattern as, as you were saying. So so there's patterns there. So I'm looking at that kind of an expansion into the patterns of patterns, but I also wanted to look at it rather than in the interpersonal relationship. I'm hinting, I, I get hints of patterns in my own cognition so I have my arguments internally that are going on, and those become, they seem to have a character of being recurring, recurring sort of thoughts that go around in a circle. So I've got inner patterns, um, and it, it's tempting to try and, and take them away from just being me to being some kind of dynamic that's going on. So it's looking for pattern descriptions that go further in and pattern descriptions that become patterns of patterns. And I wondered whether you, you played with that at all or. Uh, well, as I was alluding to earlier in the, when I showed those three figures of a three person family system and invited people to recognize that the system itself then comes internalized within each member of that system. So you get this internalized family system and relations between the the is where internalized family uh, become uh, the basis for people taking initiative then with each other. So that there's both the interpersonal patterns and the intrapersonal patterns that are operating simultaneously. Um, and so because the the richness of connectedness intrapersonally is so much greater in terms of the neurological connections, 
Um, there's more stability, as it were, for those intrapsychic patterns than there is for the interpersonal patterns. Um, and so that's why I elaborated that internalized other interviewing work as a way to try to enter into that intrapersonal space to deconstruct the person into a history of past patterns that have been internalized to deconstruct those pathologizing patterns and to co-construct healing patterns to displace them um, and then to hopefully stabilize those in the interpersonal patterns that they're living in. Uh, so there's there's a simultaneity going on in terms of interpersonal patterns and intrapersonal patterns, uh, which makes this work very rich uh, and sometimes confusing, of course. Yeah, I, I accept that as a yes. And it, <laughs> I, I, I'm just enjoying the, the shift in my thinking from your ideas. Thank you. And the following up on David's, there's also those inter interpersonal patterns, blaming self and being depressed and depression leads to more blaming. So it's a kind of the internal self. Is this, I find a problem for me sometimes. Absolutely. Yes, that's exactly what happens. Yes. Jason has a question. I can't read it, but I see your name. Actually, it was coming in next. Yeah. Oh, Jason, sorry. would you like me to... Uh to read your question. Okay, I'll go yes, ahead. Yes, yes, please. I have uh, some difficulty in connection right now. So I wrote my question in the chat box. Okay, so Jason uh, asks, um, uh, may I ask if this methodology uh, has a boundary in its usefulness or effective zone? Are, are there, so uh, I guess I would uh, restate as, um, you know, are there areas, Carl, where where you found this useful or uh, um, areas where um, there have been, uh, you know, outside the boundary of usefulness? Uh, well, absolutely. Questions are extremely useful. Extremely useful because the the um, I mean, there are limits to it, of course, and people can hide behind their questions and never kind of emerge as, as a genuine person, so forth. But but for the most part, uh, what questions do is they, they have a tendency to shift the focus to the other in terms of what's going on for the other, what the other thinks and feels, and so forth, which is where you need to be grounded clinically, at least where you're doing some work with with clients or families. Um, and so that's why I privilege questions in my work as much as possible, uh, because it's a way to um, invite the other to respond. And of course, which question I, I articulate and ask makes a huge difference. Um, and there's many dynamics involved in questioning. Um, and questions can be very punishing. And sometimes parents, of course, use questions to punish their children. Why didn't you do this? And why did you do that? So, so that questions can be very problematic, but they can be very therapeutic and helpful at times. Um, and if they're offered you know, systemically as invitations, inviting the person to respond to you know, some relevant issue that is, you know, is included as part of the question, then that allows it possible for the, the, the therapist to, to sort of try to think of what might be useful to respond with in terms of a further question. And if I could sort of co-construct together with the, the, uh, the client the healing knowledges they need to move forward in their lives with less pain and suffering, that's what I want to do. Uh, and so I try to formulate my questions to enable that process. Mm -hmm. and, and so Jason asked, how about how about a situation of interreligion, uh, interreligious relationships, or extrapolating to international relationships? Could be this type of um, uh, uh, questioning method of questioning be applicable? Probably, uh, probably. I, I I personally haven't been trafficking in those domains, but uh, I see there's potential application. Yes, for some of these ideas. And, and actually, in the, the last chapter of the book, um, there, there is some speculation about that. Yeah. There's another hand up, but I can't read the name of the person. Sophia? Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. 
Um, uh, I I have a question about, um, well, I'll just read my question. Um, if the system is looked at from the position of one person or another in the system, uh, would it change depending upon that perspective or is it is this theoretical framework general to any position in the system um, more universal or rather an outsider's perspective? Like, is there a, is would it change depending on perspective inner or outer or yeah i would say yes probably significantly um like if if we sort of look at our looking to see what we're seeing and how seeing it in that way biases us to certain you know responses that i think gives us more possibilities like when i look at a relationship and i i distinguish pathologizing patterns i want to deconstruct those and if I can imagine, you know, healing patterns and distinguish those patterns, then I want to ask questions to enable them to bring forth the the component behaviors that, you know, create those patterns and, and strengthen them, maintain them. So I, I do see this as, as an effort to reach that second order perspective in cybernetic thinking of, mm -hmm. you know, looking at or looking to see what we're seeing and or listening to our listening to hear what we're hearing and how we can then use that. <laughs> to uh, privilege what we prefer in terms of the healing and wellness patterns. Okay. Mm. Do you think that, um, well, have you, okay, can I go on to ask another question? Yes, please. Um, do you think that, um, like, have you tried to look at uh, interpersonal um wellness patterns and how they could be improved from the perspective of the self rather than the therapist yes absolutely oh, okay is did you find that there was a different pattern um or different, different different from a what? different um from uh, the the diagrams that you showed uh, seem to be from the therapist's perspective, but I'm just wondering if, uh, like the differences between the therapist's perspective versus, for example, the wife's perspective or the son's perspective, and how they could look at things differently in order to improve their own situation, because um, many times when uh we're stuck in these systems uh it's it is very helpful to go to therapy and um to uh to get outside help and do training but it's also really important to be able to see your own position in the world so that you can uh alter it in different ways and then reposition yourself in a better way so that you can improve the flow. Yes. When I've been working with families over longer periods of time, um, I tend to invite them into recognizing their own relational patterns and developing skills and distinguishing them. So that rather than getting caught in a, a lineal view of, of seeing, you know, the other person's behavior is problematic or their behavior is problematic, seeing the coupling between the behaviors and finding ways to then uh, conceive of a, of a preferred coupling of the healing coupling or the wellness coupling that would be useful to enact, to bring forth, to display, say, the problematic couplings in their relationship. And, and uh, it, one requires some capacity in terms of awareness to enter into that perspective, but that is definitely possible to develop skills in becoming more aware of relational dynamics and to use that awareness to make choices about which kind of invitations to, you know, uh, enact in terms to try to bring forth a, a more of a wellness response with the other person. So yes, families do learn to privilege preferred patterns of interaction. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, I, I just want to say that that clinical families have wellness patterns as part of their repertoire. Like I would submit that. 
that all families have a full uh, um, repertoire of all those different kinds of patterns I mentioned. But the families that come for therapies are usually families that get stuck in the pathologizing patterns. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the, they don't have wellness patterns as part of the repertoire. They do. But it's a matter of developing the flexibility to get out of the pathologizing patterns and moving back to wellness. And, and healthy families also slip into problematic patterns, but they recover more quickly through a healing pattern of, of apology coupled with forgiveness and so forth, right? So developing that fluidity, being able to move among the different kinds of patterns is what we try to enable in the therapy process and develop their competence and skill. With Do you ever show them that? Do you ever show them diagrams or? Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would, I would often, you know, diagram on the on a chalkboard the pathologizing pattern, but then I'd engage with them in a conversation to formulate what would a healing antidote look like, because if they engage in that process, it's more likely they're going to get grounded in the behavioral components of the healing pattern. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, for Thank you Sophia. Uh, Louis? Hi there. Thank you. And thank you, Carl. And I found myself getting very um, keen to um, enter into an, an exchange with you because part of what you're working on um, has a, a strong um, resonance and yet divergence in the research that I've done in my doctoral work. And I think it points to what some of what Sophia was talking about in noticing that what you've done is a come at it from a, th a therapeutic perspective. And so in the nature of your inquiry about categorizing your interventions and then looking for um, you know, and in your lineal assumptions and circular assumptions, there's almost an, an embedded assumption that we need to look to what it is somebody can do or can imagine to do in order to sort of fix them. And um, and I, so if I just sort of clarify um, where I was coming from in my research, which was I was the person who was struggling in life from a very young age. And what I was trying to look for is what the hell is going on in me that has that is making life so difficult and how come other people seem to be working. So what 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 came out of my inquiry was a way to support people to come to understand not so much what was going on for them, but what is it they're noticing? And what's the locus and focus of their noticing? And what's the nature of their noticing? And so that shift from having, so instead of coming from a therapeutic in intervention, somebody outside doing something is offering a framework that enables people to do that inquiry themselves. And so I was chuckling to myself uh, about your questions, you know, categorizing your questions. And for me, there's one iterating recursive question is what are you noticing and what are you noticing about the focus of your noticing and what are you noticing about the life and that the simultaneity of illumination and insight ch transformational change actually happening in the person at the time so i'm kind of i am curious about the 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 you know, and I, and I apologize, Pile, because I've done exactly what you've asked us not to do. Um, but I'm I'm kind of interested, Carl, in terms of that little bit that I've offered and what you're doing. You know, what what do you make of that in relation to what you're doing? Because in large part, I think there is some um, there is an assumption about fixing. And if I do certain interventions, then the persons will be fixed. And so how do you kind of square with that? You know, in terms of your actual approach? Um, well, you got a good point in terms of the importance of noticing or noticing. Um, and one sort of um, school of therapy that, I embraced to a certain extent is, is solution-focused therapy where 
the whole approach is to notice solution building possibilities and to always be looking for opportunities to respond to a client to bring forth you know their resources or competencies to build those solutions together with them um, but I, I use Matrana's theory though to help me to recognize that the stance that I adopt with the client is always invitational. It's never possible for me to put ideas into their heads or, or force them to think or feel a certain way. All I can do is to um, perturb them, as it were, their, their previous patterns of giving meaning and understanding to their life situation or experiences and so forth. But I, if I'm selective in my questions, though, I can privilege certain patterns or habits of noticing and how, like, if the more we notice our competencies, the more we enact those competencies, the more we notice our deficiencies, the more we slip into, you know, misery and, and notice more deficiencies. And so that solution-focused therapy has is, is, is helped us understand the importance of being selective in the questions we ask in that regard. Now, one of the, the problems that I have with solution-focused therapy is that it keeps too much in the hands of the therapist in terms of making those choices about those kinds of different kinds of questions because I want to empower my clients to help those to have those resources themselves. So I want them to see the connections between problems and solutions and not leave that to me uh, as a therapist. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It's a, it's a exploration, you know, there's not so much answers, but I guess the thing that, um, a, 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 re a, re a recent development in reflexive questioning has been the formulating uh, re questions, meta questions, where we ask questions about questions that, mm -hmm. that helps to make the relationship with the client more collaborative. You know, like if I ask the client, like, are these questions useful that I'm asking you? What other questions could I be asking you that might be helpful here? That that process of meta questioning is a very enriching in therapeutic conversation. Mm. Okay, Louis. Anything um, else? I'm, leave it there. I mean, there's lots I, um, you know, jump into, but not now. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry Chandler. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, uh, I admire your extraordinarily useful, uh, skillful use of language in explaining very difficult uh, situations and contexts. Uh, I think the natural sciences could learn a lot from your use of language uh, in that context. And so I appreciate the opportunity to hear the clarity of your explanations. Uh, and would like to push the, the previous questions just a little bit further. And uh, I'd like to push them from uh, second order cybernetics towards third order cybernetics and the actual dynamics of which you are evaluating as you ask your questions and you uh, notice the answers that are coming in. Uh, in your diagrams, you, as a listener, I, I have to presuppose that you are in some sense or another categorizing the uh, consequences of their answers. In other words, uh, you're making some uh, inductive conclusions of some form, however loose or loosely phrased these conclusions might be. And they may be merely a feeling of, well, the answer tends towards this direction or whatever. Uh, that uh, fits a situation that, that they've responded to. So it, as a therapist, and my question goes to you, as your personal uh, relationships of how you categorize uh, or establish some sort of hierarchy or pecking order of the systems that you are, of your conclusions, do you have a language that uh, fits the answers to your questions? Can you put into some hierarchical or some any sort of pattern, emotional patterns, for example, uh, of the nature of the answers, so that you can then communicate this to to not only within yourself, 
uh, in the future questions, but also to other therapists and, and to complete novice like myself who struggle to understand how your mind is working as you conduct these interviews. Wow, uh, that's a lot. Um, by the way, I, I'm not familiar with third order cybernetics. So, so Jerry, if you could send me something, you know, along those lines, I'd, I'd love to read in that area and to, to understand that more. Um, but uh, definitely, I have a very strong sort of passion for healing and wellness. And this this began at, when I was eight years old, and my mother died of cancer. And I wanted to help her, and and that's when I decided to become a doctor and so forth. So I, I have this passion for healing and wellness that that underlies my work. And my my colleagues and I have recently we, we just wrote a paper on bring forth this therapy, which is grounded in loving relationships. And of course, we draw very heavily from Maturana's theory, you know, in that in that paper, um, and. We're we're trying to privilege the the ethics. So I guess Heinz von Forster articulated as always act so as to open space for possi more possibilities, and uh, that ethic grounds me in my work in terms of um, trying to find ways to respond to the other, to always. And of course, we if we want to open space for them and their existence, we need to understand their condition and where they're constrained, and so we need to connect with them. Um, so a lot of our questions are orienting to get grounded, as it were, and then to try to find a space where they might be able to move and ask, formulate a question to invite them to that possibility. I don't know to what extent I was able to respond to your question, Jerry. Maybe you could elaborate. Uh, well, I, I, I understand in part, I think, uh, uh, and would go back further uh, beyond cybernetics to uh, practice uh, Charles Saunders Peirce's notions of uh, uh, do not block the path of inquiry. And uh, in but the, the difficulty I would have, since I have no clinical background or experience, is to understand what terms, what language you would use to describe how you classify the responses. You've organized the questions that you wish to ask, and you categorize these in, in a certain form that is useful to you. And I'm, I'm trying to understand how it is useful to you. I, and I can't really go much beyond that, and there's others that have questions. So let, let me just leave the, the ball in your court, and I, I can try and communicate with you offline as well. Well, it's useful to me because I want to get better at trying to be selective in the questions that I ask that open space to add life to the lives of others. You know, if I can find a question to open space for a possibility for the other that is enlivening, then I, that's the kind of question I would like to formulate. And I want to privilege those kinds of questions, if I'm able to. Okay. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the talk and the answers. Can you send me something on third order cybernetics? Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Pile, you're on mute. Yes, I had kids walking around behind me, so I went on mute. So anybody else for questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to say, I just posted an article about third order. Uh, on the chat for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, if there aren't more, we can talk about what's on next. Do we have a something planned for next one? And thank you, Carl. Thank you again and again and again. Thank you. Uh, Larry's raised his hand. Larry, do you want to interrupt oh. here? Uh, well, I, I was going to follow up on Jason's uh, question a while ago. And the way I understand the question is, you know, are there situations or what do you do in situations 
where there are fundamental differences of values among the participants. For example, I'll give, uh, and, and, and this, and, and I think this then extends to the applicability uh, of the method to interreligious or international situations. But just as an, as an example that you may have come across, say, say I'm a 14, 15 year old, uh, and uh, my two parents uh, are concerned, and part of the concern is that I've told them that I'm gay. One of the parents is deeply religious, fun, you know, fundamentalist, uh, you know, and in, in, in all the arguments that go with that. Um, uh, the other one's a little different in between, you know, doesn't know what to do and so forth. But there's a fundamental difference in values represented here. And I'm wondering if the questioning method would work in that kind of situation. Well, we encounter that as therapists all the time. Um, and our orientation generally is to try to find common ground. You know, well, well there's a literature of, of conflict, high conflict families. There's a lot of discrepancies in terms of values or beliefs or whatever. And, and we focus on, on the, the, those discrepancies and try to find common ground and expand that common ground if possible. And one of the strategies that we use for that is to co-construct, you know, the difference between intentions and effects and recognizing that sometimes there's a, there's a, a misfit um, that the actual effect is not what is intended. And when people recognize the contradiction between good intentions and negative effects, they're more likely to be open to consider other ways of implementing their good intentions. And so therapeutic conversations engaging in that kind of process of, of um, co-constructing awareness are useful to enable movement towards possibility. Um, even if the possibility is to come to agree to disagree, um, that in itself is the beginning of some agreement, uh, which you know, sometimes helps people to move forward. And in therapy work generally, I mean, full agreement is seldom possible. We, we sort of find ways to manage differences or try to enable people to find ways to cope with differences. Carl, we have a question in the uh, chat whether you would be willing to share an email address for those who would like to continue the dialogue with you. Oh, sure. Be happy to. Um, let me just put it in the chat then. Okay. And are there any other questions from the group? I don't think so. Given that, Pilay, would you like to talk about What's I next? am not actually aware what is our next. Ah. I was hoping somebody else. Howard? Would. Howard, yes. Dr. Sir. Sure. Well, due to some uh, scheduling challenges, we'll be shifting to Saturday uh, meeting uh, next month. That'll be on February 10th. And that will be uh, Evan Thompson and Bruce Clark in conversation with Domini Pereira. And what time, Howard? Uh, you know, I don't recall exactly exactly the time. Uh, we'll, it'll be in the you know in the invitation soon. Okay, I think it's likely to be noon Eastern time. So regular time, or well, thank you everybody for coming, as well as thanking once again, Carl. And I imagine this has led to a further networking of further connections, which should be enriching to all of us. And I actually also hope that you'll be able to come to the next AFC meeting, which will be in Washington, D.C. this uh, next uh, summer, I think it is.